also Country Dance Online and Social Dance Online. If you haven't visited those sites, do it. They're cool too. So in this video, we are going to cover the questions from the previous week that we were unable to get to. Some of these questions came in through email. Some of these questions came in through Facebook comments. And some of these questions came in through YouTube comments or chat. And for some reason, despite putting out about 14 videos this week, we were not able to answer all the questions. So we're going to try to do that in this video. So this is going to be a smorgasbord of a random topic. So hold on tight. Ben, to a suggestion from one of our YouTube email, email subscribers, um, has a microphone. So he's going to narrate the questions. You should be able to hear him. And then if one of the girls has to hop in to help answer the questions, she'll come around here with the mic. So what is our first question, Mr. Benjamin? Our first question is, it's continuing off the conversation um, from the last class where uh, people were talking about their um, partner outdancing them. Is it rude to outstyle your partner and outdance your partner? Oh, good question. So, and I don't have to repeat the question because you heard it. So is it rude to outstyle your partner? Um, if you are, I think we do have a responsibility to our partners um, to not make them uncomfortable, right? So this does happen to me a lot if I have a newer follower. I will do some stuff because I'll be dancing basic patterns that I think are appropriate to the follower, and I will have some fun with my own styling. If I find that that's making my partner uncomfortable, I'll certainly calm it down, right? Now, I think we all have our own rights to our own dancing, and as long as we're responsible within the partnership lead and follow wise to keep everyone comfortable and safe within the dance, that's cool. And then from there, it just depends on how much of a responsibility you take towards making that partner more comfortable. And I would like to think that for those of us who become more advanced and have some more styling options, that we would be somewhat cognizant of that. So is it rude to style? No. If you are uh, ruining the dance experience for the both of you, well, that's not good for either one of us. So it's probably a bad idea. But if you're um, moving around, and I've had people say something to this, um, to me specifically like, oh, I'm not moving that way or I can't move like that. And I'm like, hey, man, I'm just having a good time. Like, you're doing great. So as long as you can keep it positive and um, as long as you can keep the dance positive and functional and happy for both of you guys, I think it's totally fine to style your way around. But I would, uh, going off the last class of how do we find our own style, I would definitely um, search for that and then communicate that to your partner. And I think it's also safe to communicate if you are a newer person and you're a little intimidated to say, hey, I'm new at this. You know, I've only been to beginner class for three weeks, five weeks, seven weeks. I've only been dancing for two months. Um, that helps, let's say, if you're a follower coming up to me and telling me where you're at, that helps me set my expectation for the dance. Um, I think those of us who've been around for a little bit longer probably know this a little bit instinctively, that it's kind of our job to um, keep the newer dancer comfortable because we don't want them to quit. We want to grow our community. So hopefully that answers your question. Do you guys have any thoughts on that? No. no? That's about what I would have said. Boom. Sometimes we're on the right path, but sometimes they come up with good ideas that I didn't think of. <laughs> um, going back to the class yesterday, musically, musicality problem solved. Um, what are some tips to help find the beat and where to start at the beginning of the song? Ooh, how do we find the beat at the beginning of the song? And man, that's like the biggest, we covered like biggest problems of musicality salt and because we can't play music typically on YouTube or at least it's a little tricky for us to do, um, we do have music in our course, but the trick of finding the beat of the music is the biggest, um, is the biggest struggle. Do you guys have any tips? Like how would I find the beat at the beginning of the song? I assume like what do you tell your students, Ms. Megan? Ms. Megan's off camera. She's going to hear her voice. All right. So um, what I tell my students is that essentially when the singer starts singing, that's probably a one in the music. Also, um, as soon as you start hearing those heavier beats, you're going to start counting. And um, like I said, so when the singer starts singing, maybe start with a one from there and then count as you go. Yeah, so I think part of it, right, is, and this is the struggle of it, for some of us it's natural, right? So to some degree I had some natural ability to understand music, but I wasn't a musician, so certainly early on I took a workshop on musicality, very, very early on, like maybe my first 
maybe my first dance event, right? I came out of the bar, went to the local competition, and I took a technique workshop and a musicality workshop. And what that did was uncover, um, it gave me some knowledge. So to Megan's point, if you have some knowledge of music, right? Feeling and upbeats and downbeats is tricky because upbeats and downbeats are different for musicians versus dancers, right? The downbeat would be the one, right? But for us, the, the down feeling beat would be the two. So if I dance the sugar push is my workspace, right? The one, two, three, and four, five, and six. Those are full beats to the um, one step to one beat of music. So typically those are gonna be the heavier beats. But to Megan's point, typically, and this is not all the time, but typically the lyrics are gonna be accenting the ones, threes, fives, and sevens. Ones most of the time, fives following that, threes and sevens occasionally, right? It's the rare song where the lyrics are accenting two, four, six, and eight. So uncovering that kind of what we call the map, and in our course we, we, we do three maps of music. We do a basic map, which will help you sort out the beat and finding the beat. The second map, we're really trying to uncover how do we connect to our patterns and our, ac uh, and our styling accents to the music. And then at the high level, we're talking about what if the song is crazy town and has all these weird tags and bridges and, and weird phrasing and how do we sort that out? But I think understanding your bass music, and I've not done this, but I would actually type that, how to hear the beat in music into YouTube and I guarantee you'll find some musicians and we found that for the musicality course. In fact, one of the videos we share in that, I literally stole from uh, a YouTube video because the musician did such a great job with the video of understanding beats and music and swing beats in, in a way that I could have never created on my own. So I think some basic education in music will help lock you in to some of the basics. So hopefully that answers your question. Another question. Is it better to dance West Coast Swing to slower music? I tend to find it more difficult. Is it better to dance West Coast Swing to slower music? I tend to find it more difficult. Good question. Um, West Coast Swing, to the best of my knowledge, came from much, much, much faster music, right? Like Lindy Hop style music, which is super fast. And I think even into the 90s and 2000s, the music stayed pretty fast. Like 120 beats a minute was not super uncommon. Now you're getting most of your beginner classes are going to be done in the low 90s beats per minute. And there's some songs that people dance to that are literally as slow as the 60s beats per minute range, right? So it is harder to dance to slow music. And the reason we say this to our students, slow tells the truth, right? Because each beat is a space of time. And if the space of time is small and you're slightly off beat, your, it, the window is much smaller, right? If it's a slower song, the space of time for each beat is much bigger. So whether you're clearly on the beat in the early part or at the end, there's a longer bit of time. So I would say if, if, I, if you tag me to a number, I would say West Coast Swing from a, and you guys can chime in on this, from a easiest beats per minute range would probably be in the low 90s. Low 90s would be, Super slow, 80 to 90 is a good Yeah, so tempo. like learning in the 90 some odd beats a minute range would be a great thing because that is a slow enough uh, beats per minute for us to physically move our feet through all the steps. But for sure, the slower the music gets, the harder it gets to stay on time and understand that because you're, um, you're able to see the differences in timings between your partners more and that makes it more challenging. Do something? There's, um, there's actually a link, the 10 best practice songs that we have on our website, yep. which I will link below. But we also have a slow West Coast music practice playlist on YouTube. So those Ooh. range from anywhere, I think, like 70 to 72 to, I believe, 100. But there are a completely, there's a wide variety of the slow songs. There are lyrical songs yep. that have the softer feel to them and are a little harder to hear as far as the beat goes and then there are some very upbeat still slow but very clear songs uh, to practice yeah. to so those would be a good place to start bingo so is it harder yes it's probably harder um certainly below 90 beats a minute it starts to get harder in fact i had a song oh i forget cyclone a song called cyclone Ben laughed he's like oh my god so i used to make i had a small group of practice students for uh a number of years and I would always run our drills to that song because it was in the 80 some odd beats a minute range and it was hard to keep the timing and it told the truth 
of where you were in the music. So yes, it is harder to dance super slow than it does fast, um, provided you can move your feet to that speed of music. Next question, Mr. Benjamin. Um, along those same lines, do you find any benefit to using a metronome for practicing? Oh, in the previous video, we talked about Devin, my nerdy student. And so we talked about using a metronome. And he was maybe the only person in all these years of the studio that actually used a metronome. Yeah, I think that's a fantastic idea, right? Musicians do it because they need to keep time. Um, fun fact, when I got a little bored pat this past winter, I, um, I started practicing drumming. I bought a pad and I practiced drumming. And the t it was disgusting how poor my timing is, right? And I try to learn some, like we all do. I try to learn harder stuff before I practice my basics. But even as I went to the basics of stuff, keeping time was super duper hard. Bingo. There you go. Does All that right. answer the question? Yes. Cool. Um, so this question came from our last class on having or how to find your own style. Can you demonstrate and walk through the process of a body roll? Oh, can we demonstrate and walk through the process of a body roll? So I kind of alluded to this at one point in saying I have to move one body part um, by itself. And so I used to travel the country and the world, and I've literally taught this in uh, – probably 20 some odd countries. And so what I would do is we would teach this, let's quickly cover the drill and let's cover the, the deal. So I have to practice moving one body part in isolation, right? Let's say just my shoulder, right? Then I need to be able to isolate my shoulder and move my rib cage away from my hip. Then I need to be able to close my rib cage back up and release my shoulder. So the shoulder's number one. Let me go a little closer to the camera. Shoulder's number one, rib cage is number two. Then I need to isolate my hip, so I need to be able to unhinge my hip, and I need to practice the unhinge of the hip back and forth. And in a live class, this is really fun because I get everyone really thinking about this. You haven't seen this. This is old school Brian B. This is like circa, no, this is circa like early 2000s, before any of you guys are around, even before Miss Megan. So we have our shoulders in isolation, right, our rib cage moving in isolation, this part you look really weird, and now I re release my hip, and then I have to straighten my knee to swing through my leg. Then I push my knee back forward, then I push my hip forward, and I tell people you have to isolate just your hips, and I get them to do this for a little while because it's half entertainment and half technical, and then we move through our hips. Now my hip's in place, I move my rib cage back on top of it, but I have to keep my shoulder back, and I release my shoulder, right? And so that's kind of the process. And so what I, what I do is a point, can someone toss me a pen? So if you've ever been bored in class and done this with a pen, at the right speed, it starts to look like it's rubbery. Would you agree, right, even though it's solid? At the right speed, it looks like it's rubbery. Good catch, Miss Megan. So the trick is, is can I move everything in isolation in the right order? Right, and we do all these drills around with the hips and then back up, and then we practice with the shoulder, right? And you can add the head around, all that stuff, right? And so what I do is, I, can I take the pen back again? So one of the things I do when I teach everyone in a big class, and I haven't done this for years, these guys haven't seen it. Um, we take everyone, we stand them shoulder to shoulder in class, and we have, I say, when I point the pen at you, you're gonna start your body roll. So I point the pen at someone, they start the body roll, right? And then I move myself around the room. And so the roll or the ripple moves around the room. Then I stop and I go, okay, stay there. Now we're gonna do it in reverse. So everyone body rolls, they follow the pen all the way around and the pen comes back and they ripple the way back. And then what I tell people is I say, did anyone look at anyone in the class specifically to see if they did it right? And the answer is no, because your eye, Ben says, I did it right. Because your eye just follows from one person to the next. And as long as this person moves and this person moves and this person moves, it, each person doesn't have to be brilliant, but because it's in the right order, um, the ripple looks really cool. So that is the gist covered in the ultimate guide to leaders and follower styling, where we work on the ripple of moving a body part in isolation all the way up and all the way down. Practicing them in the right order is the key. Hopefully that answered the question. The next question, what is the best way to make it clear to your follower that you are leading an outside role? Oh, what's the best way? This comes from a video we did uh, last week. So the outside role, yeah, we'll steal Miss Megan. 
So most of us know the inside roll, we call the inside turn, where we go, that's an inside turn, right, from a left side pass. It's an inside turn from a left side pass. Cool? This is my left side pass. But then we have an outside roll. So that comes from a right side pass, the follower is passing the right side, and an outside roll looks like that, right? If we do it the other way, an outside roll. And there's lots of cool things I can do with an outside roll. So the question was specifically, how do I lead the outside roll? Um, I need to prep the step before the turn, right? So in an inside roll, I go one. I don't need one as a prep. I need the second beat as a prep. And if I do that well, you shouldn't see the hand move too much visually, right? If we're well connected, right? On the one, I don't need that. I need the second one as a prep. And if I use my, my body properly in my prep, Miss Megan is prepped, right? Commonly in an inside roll, we'll prep both beats because it's sort of like a warning signal, like here it comes, and off we go. What happens in the outside roll? And the, the, I remember this question, it was a long question with a lot of details, I appreciate it. So in an outside roll, this looks a lot like a whip, the beginning part of the turn, right? So whatever I would do to lead a whip, if I think about it like a J hook lead, if you look at this from behind, right? If I took myself out of the equation, if I think of this as a J hook lead, a little bit of a J, that's a good way to think about it. Um, might be a little old school, but it's the one that I use. So the key is I have to maintain connection on the one. If I maintain, and I say I, both of us are maintaining connection through that hand. Then when I turn the hand back, my follower turns back, right? Now, and the question was like, well, hey, what do I need to do if I want the follower to continue that turn? And so the key was, and I'm going to do it this way. I'm going to go this way. I'm just this stepping way. out of the way, yeah. Gotcha. So that hand moves down line. Now I might, if I'm going to continue the energy, I have to do two things. Number one, I might create a little bit more of a prep. Now as I turn her back, I have to switch this hand to this position. I'm going to show you this from the other angle, right? So I lead one, two. So I've led the turn, but during this process, I need to have a moment to switch the hand so I can continue over Megan's head for the outside roll, right? That's the key. But I think key number one is, we'll go back this way. Key number one is we both need to maintain the connection on the one, right? Number two, I need to almost overlead the one with a little bit of a prep. So this is probably coming across this. I'm going to exaggerate this a little bit. Across the slot that way. That might be pretty severe, but just so you can see a little bit across the slot so that the prep is set up. Now Megan's headed that direction so my hand changes and she continues that energy the same way. So even if I did it with my right hand through this like behind the back thing, I'm leading her diagonally across the slot a little bit. She's still stepping forward, but we're maintaining connection. Now the hand goes this direction, which causes her to turn. Now she's gonna hopefully continue that energy through the turn. So that is how I lead an outside roll in West Coast Swing, which was the seven patterns you need to know after the beginner patterns, that, that fundamental outside turn position. Not because the outside roll is always what you're going to use, but there's a bunch of different patterns you can use that lead or follow for. Um, when followers are free, so they're out of um, a closed hold or you're not touching them at all, you're not connected, what are the rules that they use to determine when they should continue, stop, or circle back to the leader? Ooh, that's a good question. So what are the rules for the follower? I'm so used to repeating the question, but you heard the question. Um, circle back to the follower. Do we have any context on that? Yep. So JB's uh, tuck, where you all did the eye thing and you kept walking, how did she know to come back to you? Oh, good question. So I wish I could remember that move. It, there was an extra walk, walk on a tuck. It was a, it was a tuck. Did we let go? Yeah. Yes. I think it was off of a... It was off a close. Oh, we so did. We did too. Uh, yeah. Cool. So because we just did that right there, real, and how do we know that uh, Megan was anchoring because I thought she had an extra couple walk walks. So I think the key is thinking about West Coast Swing in two beat increments, right? So we've done this before, so if, if this is the move, right, we go one, two, and three, four, five.
five, six, seven, and eight, right? We taught that move, we did that. If you caught that, it was on a dance cruise that we did. So that's a little bit off script, right? Because a normal tuck would be something like one, two, and three, four, five, and six. But we know we can extend the walks. And by we, meaning it could be me, it could be Miss Megan, one, two, and three, four. We went five, six, seven, and eight. So the question is, and I'm glad I asked for context, because like, let's say the follower is left to her own devices, right? So how do we both, how does the follower know to turn back to the leader, and how does the leader know to finish the pattern? You saw how the leader knows to finish the pattern at the end. I'm thinking in two bit, at the beginning of this. I'm thinking in two-bit increments, right? One, two, and one, two. One, two, one, and two. I'm thinking that way. So what if Miss Megan decided to add two extra walks, right? One, two, and one, two. One, two, one, two, oh, one, and two. So from that perspective, I got you. We got a little bit off there. From that perspective, as the follower turns back to me in that specific pattern, I know that we've got two beats left, typically the anchor step. Even if I screw it up in my footwork, see if we can do this correct. One, two, and one, two. One freeze, two. Let's say I screw up as a leader and I go, do your two walks. One and two. I screwed up, I anchor stepped, I'm on the wrong foot, right? And now Miss Megan turns back to me for one and two. Two. So I had to do a walk, walk instead of a triple, but we worked it out. So that goes off script in terms of basic stuff. We like to teach things that are basic and fundamental, but thinking about it in two beat increments is how you get to those cool moments. Boom, 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 into whatever else we do. I'm just thinking about it in two beat increments. And if you screw up, either a triple step catches you back up or a walk, walk. When in doubt, walk it out. Cool. From the follower's point of view, because <laughs> that was really the leader's. Um, from the follower's point of view, I'm always aware of where my partner is. I've always got a handout if they want to uh, take it or whatever else. Um, and I'm also looking out of the corner of my eye. If you noticed when we did this pattern, I was also somewhat turned to him so I could see where he was. Um, if I can't see my partner at all, I have no clue where they are. And if you can't, that's a good clue to the leader that we're not done. Mm -hmm. I've let her go, and I have to just follow. Yeah, if you noticed, when I took extra walks, I did not turn to him. Boom, 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 boom. Right, so Megan's away from me. So I, but the hand's still available, which does allow us to be somewhat partnered. So there's a good, there's a good idea. Hopefully that answers the question. Next question. Next question. How do you lead the duck from a basket whip? <laughs> a duck. We did, Emily and I did this. You did a duck from a basket whip. We did whip. basket whips. Because <laughs> you don't. Oh. oh, yeah, old school. Hashtag Bob Waters. Um, so, how do I lead the duck? We're going to go. This way? This way. No, it's no. got to be this way. Boom, 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 boom. So how do I lead the duck? There's two things that happen. Number one, I could forearm shiver my partner. Yeah, probably not the best. And she knows that it's going to duck. But the point is there needs to be something. And the question is, what is that something? So when I get here, we're going to turn sideways so you can see. If I have connection in this hand, let's even go nice and close to the camera. If I have connection in this hand, right, without even touching Miss Megan, the fact that I start to move my forearm and the way we describe this connection for all of our stuff is I'm feeling the connection through my partner's elbow all the time, whether I'm here, whether I'm here. So even when she's wound into this duck position, even though my forearm might be against her back, if we're both doing a good job, we're connected through our elbows. So even the action of me starting to raise my hand, and you guys can't see this, but I'm not touching Megan's back, but the action of me moving my arm and elbow up will help. Number two, so I still have that connection in my hand. Number two, I will use my forearm to add extra insurance. As I'm doing this, the second thing I'm doing is raising my elbow. So if we do this, it's maybe- just to initiate. Yeah, maybe this, right? Partially the hand and partially the elbow. So I just want you to see the path of the elbow. So right now, she's feeling a forearm on her back. We'll do this the other side. 
But the other key is that I raise the elbow really high so she doesn't have to duck so far. The other part of that is I could actually use both hands, right? Both hands through this action to get her out, right? So both hands are creating a turn down, right? Both hands are creating a turn down. I could use my thumb a little bit. And when I say thumb, I'm like, don't push on her. Um, and if I did that and she didn't go, I would let go. That would be my rule. But as the follower, I think you're trying to figure out what's different. Well, if you run into an arm. Duck. Maybe duck. <laughs> uh, what I tell my leaders and what I actually do as a follower leading, if that made any sense, uh, is I do exactly what Brian said. I essentially initiate my follower with my hand and my arm, and then I lift to make sure that they can go under. I would agree 100%. You must be a good leader. Mm -hmm. Want Mike? No. <laughs> what else we got, Benji? Going back to musicality, what is the best way to return to dancing after a break? Assuming that you break, um, for this example, assume that you t uh, hit a break on a five. So what a break is in the music is something where basically the beat stops. Typically it will happen on a five, we'll go one, two, three, and four, a five, six, seven, eight, into one, two, right? So in the break in the music, I'm still counting the music in my head to fill up the space, right? So hopefully by the time a break arrives, a great song that has awesome breaks is uh, Maroon 5 Secret. We use that in the third level of mapping the music in our ultimate guide to musicality because it's got a couple of great, not secret, no, stitched up. Oh my God, another great song. I like Maroon 5 Secret. Stitched Up, Stitched Up by John Mayer and Herbie Hancock. That's the song I love. Great West Coast Swing song, good clear beat, cool musicality, and some breaks, somewhat predictably on count five. So how do I re-enter the music? If I, can I steal you for a second, Miss Megan? So a break would be, this would be a typical, if we go one, two, three, and four of five, six, seven, eight, oh, one. Too. So very much in that, if you watch that on slow-mo, two things are going on. Number one, we're both counting a five. Hold six, seven, eight, re-enter on the one. And so what Megan did is she was actually on the wrong foot, but she made sure that the correct foot was free. One, f I'm sorry, five, six. <laughs> no, it's one, two. One, two, three, and four, a five, six. And then she actually did seven, eight. I'm already on the right foot. I've sorted that out. I could have done seven, eight, as long as I re-enter on the one. That would be the most standard way of re-entering. But I think the key is to continue counting the music um, in your head, maybe out loud in the beginning, but and one. That would be the way I'd be thinking about it. I'd be counting the music and really kind of feeling those two beat increments because there could be... Um, as the, on, from a higher level, the music could re-enter on the one with a change, right? So we could go one, two, three, and four, five, six, seven, eight, and we feel a change in the music, and we're thinking about that in two beat increments. So we have one, two, three, and four, a five, six, seven, eight, a beat, and beat, and beat, and beat, and beat, beat, triple B. Cool? Yep. So. Um, a little bit more on that. What are some ideas of things to do? So they, once they, uh, they figure out where to come back in, what can they do? What can you do? You can rewatch the How to Find Your Own Styling. What can you do? The West Coast Swing Styling Checklist. I could do things with my head. I could do things with my shoulders. What's that? When you come back in. Oh, when you come back in? Walk, walk. <laughs> Probably nine times out of ten. Walk, walk. If I, and I'd be interested, if you probably broke down, I would bet that prob at least 75% of the time after a break, five, six, seven, and eight, oh, one, two, three, four, and walk, walk. I know I did the wrong numbers, but you get the idea. Um, almost always a walk, walk. Probably, and I'm guessing here, because sometimes I do this, I actually will look through like 50 videos and come up with a percentage. Maybe 25% of the time, there might be something in the music where they go like, I hope I don't mess up my micro, five, six, seven, and eight, oh, whatever the beat is, right? And then they'll be doing two beat increments within this. And if you watch High Level Jack and Jill's, there's a moment where the girl almost <laughs> falls and they pull them back up. 
But all of that, they're counting the two beat increments. So whatever I'm doing, I'm probably pulsing within those two beats, right? One, two, three, and four of five, six, seven, eight. And then I'm re-entering either just standard on a walk, walk, right? Or whatever's going on, Robert Royson's great at this, there's going to be pulses in two beat increments. One, two, one, two, one, and two, one, and two, right? Whether it's a hitch, whatever it's going to be, it's going to be in those two beat increments. So whether it's a, whether it's a swivel, whether it's a roll, whether it's a hitch, I'm thinking in two-bit increments, but then you could do all sorts of stuff styling-wise. Hopefully that answers it. So the next one's right along those lines. As a follower, how do I get my leader to hit a break with me? How can I tell the leader through the connection that that's what I'm hearing to the music? I'm going to go have a drink, and the girls are going to answer this. <laughs> oh, you're serious? Yeah, you're the, hey, I'm not, I can't tell you what you do. What do you think, Emily? You can hop back out here. You did say the girls. Yeah, that's what I said. She can come back out. So what, what do you do as the follower? Here's one thing that happens. Ben, to what do I do as the follower? Something different every time. Right. <laughs> Rewatch the previous video. I don't know as a follower if I ever actually try to get my leader to do the break with me unless we're in a like a whip scenario where I'm in closed hold and then I will take an extra big step and make sure that they feel from compression that I want them to go with me. I take a slightly different approach. Well, um, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. No, um, so if I am dancing with someone that I'm not comfortable dancing with and I have not danced with them a lot, if I try to say hit a beat or have us hit the beat together, it is something a little bit more minimal than say what I would do with probably Brian or Ben. Um, ben, you can ask him, I don't hijack, but I kind of lead us into specific yeah. um, moves or hits because most of the time I know the music better than he does, like 100% of the time. Um, <laughs> Yeah, so if, like, for instance, there are a couple times where, like, the snap turn that we did the other day, there are times where you might accent, like, syncopate up into that instead of going just straight time through. That was a snap turn, sorry. I don't know what they did behind me, snap but apparently turn. it was a snap turn. Um, so that's one thing that doesn't really take away from the leader, so you can find different alternatives to moves like that that doesn't necessarily um, hijack, but it accents specific things. So in Lou, they are also accenting the one. You're welcome, leaders. Ben, has something? Typically, you will, from my side of it, and you'll blurry you always, but um, typically, I can feel your syncopation because you'll increase the connection as you're Bingo. the syncopation. So Ben said, and that was actually a perfect segue, because um, Ben said he can feel like a change in the connection as Emily is entering, say, a syncopation. So from a leader standpoint, this gets to be, I always jokingly call this, like the secrets that the leaders never tell you. So you go to this workshop and they show you this really cool move, but what they don't tell you is entering the move, they're all like right here before the move starts, they're already changing something. So you guys can't see it, but Megan can feel it. I normally don't use my thumb, right? And I normally don't squeeze the whole grip. But right here, I've already squeezed a grip. Megan's already annoyed with the way I'm holding her hand. <laughs> but that quick little squeeze of the grip gets her to pay attention so that when the next move comes up, she basically, what I'm trying to do, and this becomes the conversation of West Coast Swing, is if I'm feeling something, and I'm speaking from the leader standpoint, but it's the exact same thing from the follower standpoint, right? If if I'm feeling something in the music, seven, eight, and one, and I want to accent this, seven, eight, oh, one, right? That could very easily, from a beginner standpoint, just be seven, eight, one, and two, three, four, right? So how would Megan know that we're going to do that? She might feel it, but to your point, she wants to do that. How would, now, if I want to do it, I would change something in a connection. So we get two walks, and right here, before we even take the two walks, Megan knows that something's different. She feels the connection. Okay, now she's paying much more attention to what's going on. And from the flip side, she would do the same to me, right? What Ben said, like right here, she would change something. Like already she's 
hunkering into that connection. So I'm thinking I'm doing my whip and she's, I can feel her body. She's adding a lot more pressure than normal. So this doesn't become a, if you add 20% more pressure, it means this, right? This becomes much more artistic. It just means you're getting the leader to pay attention. And then as you're dancing your own body, he's either going to be clued into that and right in sync, or at the very, or at the very least, it's going to go crazy, awry for two to four beats. And it's West Coast Swing. You do a walk, walk, and an anchor and you're back on. But something that changes in your connection or your intent in your movement would communicate to the leader. It's not gonna work all the time, but as we level up, you'll communicate more and more. And even at the highest levels, there's slight misses in terms of at the highest level it becomes, this is what Megan was thinking, right? Because this is the thing from my old school. We're old school, we didn't crawl around on the floor, but now all the good people crawl around the floor, right? So I'm thinking something that's upright Right? I'm thinking something like this, but all of a sudden some chick grabs a hold of me and spins. That was, that was quite fun. good. That was good, right? <laughs> so if I'm thinking upright and Megan drops to the floor, we have a problem at a high level. But if we're more in tune, um, that happens. bingo, that happens. That was quite good. We are in tune. Good job. We will. Ben will get to it, I think. Um, staying along those lines, how do you work the music whenever there's a tag? How do I work the music when there's a tag? So a tag would be if we're, oh, I just ripped down my piece of paper. I literally just had my, from the musicality course like a month ago, we had, it's all ripped up. Um, we graphed out from the course how we write out sets of eight. So if you imagine, can you grab that and wipe it off and grab a little board? Just so I can describe whoever's watching this, what a tag is and then what we would do to it. But first I want to describe what a tag is. Just that in the marker. And then make sure we can see that in the camera. Can we see that all right? Yeah. Okay, so if we were counting a 32 beat phrase of music, we would have four sets of eight, right? And so if we had 32 beat phrase music, we'd have sets of eight. But sometimes, and we actually covered this in the musicality course, um, you might have a weird four before it goes back. Oh, that's a terrible eight. Right, so we have 32 beats, 32 beats, four beats, and then 32 beats. This could be called a tag or a bridge. I don't really care what you call it, but you have this weird four beats that doesn't follow our eight beat max, right? And it kind of breaks up the flow of the song, sometimes artistically for the artist, sometimes it's more fun because it's a little bit different and less predictable. But how would I manage that as a dancer? Number one, I would know what the heck it is, enough to feel it in the music. Typically, there'll be something that leads into it that would change, that would cause you to sense it. And then how I would sort it out with my partnership, um, number one, the understanding of music, but practically speaking, two beat increments, right? So if I dance five, six, seven, and eight, one and two, right? And then I'm, that's not five, six, seven, and eight. What would be three, four, five, and six, seven and eight, right? And there'd be four beats hanging out and I wanted to get to the next one. I would have to think in two beat increments to get through it. So number one, just kind of understanding musical music in general to be able to predict that it's happening. And then within the dance, I'd be thinking in two beat increments, kind of going back to the previous thing where we said, what do we do with those extra beats that with that break, right? I'm thinking in two beat increments, either I'm holding still through those four beats, or I'm doing something through those four beats, um, but I first have to know it's there, and then I'm gonna use those four, the two beat increments to bridge myself through that tag or bridge. All right, switching gears just a little bit, this was from our cha-cha class. There is a request to go over the lead for a cross-body lead in more details. Cross-body lead, cha-cha, more details. This is a cross-body lead in cha-cha. Oh, one, two, three, four, and one, two, three, four, and one, two, three. If we did it the other way, two, three, this is my cross body lead. So the neat thing through our West Coast Swing training that I think ballroom dancers don't speak about in the same way because they tend to be more pattern oriented, but the general idea of the follower is going the direction she's sent until told otherwise, right? So if we dance a basic, 
Unlike West Coast Swing, this basic is automatic, right? Unlike, there's not a place, it's not like Megan's anchored back there and she's only moving when I move her, right? Once we start that basic, it's automatic. But here's the part that we can draw from West Coast Swing. If we've done this, right? Cha, 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 Megan goes back, she goes forward. Because I'm gonna continue in this direction, that's the direction she's gonna go. So specifically what I do to lead it as the leader, I have to drop this hand underneath, right? So that I can create some space to open my body up, right? So I have to, this is the clue, the hand coming down, but why is the hand coming down? Because it provides me some space to open my body up. So from a, uh, we'll do it from behind, we'll do a full basic, one, two, three, four, and one. So Megan's going back forward. So her energy is going towards the camera. And now I've dropped my hand. I'm gonna move to the side with my cha, cha, cha. And that continues Megan in that direction. She's still continuing that direction for count two. Now I pull both hands up for three, and now I take her back into the basic. If I were to leave her there, right, there is an automaticness to this that we don't have in West Coast. It's a, somewhat of a self-propelled dance. But once I have this, I could take Megan's energy and move forward and back. And if I took that energy and I dropped my hand and opened myself sideways, I would bring her back. So the drop of the hand, number one, um, sorry dear, the drop of the hand, number one, that's the clue. I open my body and then I have both hands on my follower to bring her through and then I take this back up. What can you do from the follower standpoint? Mm -hmm. Stay stuck to that hand, right? <laughs> what can you do as the leader if she doesn't stay stuck to this hand? Use both hands to keep her stuck to that hand. I have both hands on her, so I have a pretty good ability to move her with me her, her, because I got both hands on her. Cross body lead, four cha-cha. All right, the next one is expanding on the anchor step drill with the band. Expanding on the anchor step drill with the band. Can we get the mic for Miss Megan? Because this is her groove. We started to cover this the other night and I must have got carried away, so we're gonna do it here. Fashion is how you would like. Can't get it on my pants. <laughs> okay, there we go. They can hear you and see you, by the way. I know. Um, okay, so with the, uh, this is called a couple different things. Theraband's probably the most recent name for it. I know it was called a Dynaband when I used it, but um, you can attach this to a doorknob. I don't know if I call this an anchor step drill. It's more of a connection drill, um, but you can connect this to a doorknob, anything that it can latch onto and not fly off, because let me tell you, if you're connected away from that, that's not gonna be fun. Snap. Um, you are going to want to start um, probably a little tiny bit connected already and I would do a sugar push just because it's easy and you don't have to move like a underarm pass or anything so you have one two three and four on count four you want to have at least a little bit of tension in this uh, Dynaband and then you're going to on your anchor create more tension away five and especially on count six and that's going to take your whole body away from that. Do you have anything to add? Bingo, yeah, so in terms of how much, let's say Megan has, she's anchored back in whatever, because this is different in West Coast Swing for all of us. Whatever this connection is that you're comfortable with, for you, let's call that a 10. So let's not decide if it's too much, too little, but for you, when you feel good and connected at the end of this, and I've danced with dancers that are, uh, that are like a 12 of a 10 <laughs> for me, and that are like a two of a 10 for me. But whatever that is at the end, let's call that a 10, right? So that's count six. When you get to count four, one, two, three, and four, Megan said it earlier, you have some tension. What's a good amount here? Let's call that half. Let's call that a five of 10. So about half of what you're gonna build to, and then as you build into your anchor, anchor step, it builds to a 10, and then off you go, a one, two, three, and four five on a scale of 10, count four. Are you with me? And you'll build it there. Now, we also talked about the build. Can you do that one more time? Two, three, and four. We build this by rolling through your feet, rolling through your feet. So if you don't have a Dynaband or a TheraBand, one of the things we did was, you can hold that, 
the anchor step drill against the wall. Am I if wall? you have a wall. Am I the wall? I'm the wall. So if there's a wall, you don't have a Dynaband, and Megan does her sugar push, one, two, three, and four, and two, three, and four. She's got nothing to stretch into. So now she's going to, as she anchor steps on her five and six, five and six, she's going to fill out the space to the wall, right? And what that does is that the only way you can do that when there's a wall behind you, you don't want to go one, two, three, and run into the wall, right, or go five and run into the wall. So when you do that slowly, you have to dance one, two, three, and four, and you're not sure where that wall is. So you have to measure the, row, the, um, the trowel of your center back through your feet until you feel that wall. Now, mm -hmm. in my experience, your hips and shoulders will be up against that wall by the end. Probably your hips or rear end will hit it slightly first just because it's a little bit more prominent, and then your shoulders will settle in. If you're finding it through your shoulders first, eh, eh, terrible. Um, if you're finding it with only your hips, also not good. If you're carrying your center on top of each other with a forward poise, that means your uh, shoulders are slightly out in front of your hips, you'll run in with your hips and you'll click in with your shoulders still with a forward poise. So that is everything I know about an anchor step with a TheraBand and a wall. And that might complete. No, we got more questions. My question? What? Oh, you need it. Oh, <laughs> Benjamin needs the mic. <clears throat> Don't tell us to get a third you mic, dear God. We have like $800 <laughs> of the microphone. All right. $900 Those are our West Coast Wing dance related questions. We have two more. The first one is what are the best dance movies for lockdown? What are the best dance? I'm going to pull up my chair for this. What are the best dance movies for lockdown? <laughs> I am a terrible movie watcher. Terrible. I literally see about a movie a decade. <laughs> My terrible, probably because I watched this early in my dancing. What's the stupid ballet movie that Center I Center Stage, and Center it's not stupid, it's amazing. Center Stage. <laughs> I like that stupid movie. It's pretty terrible acting, <laughs> but I liked it. And the I, dancing is legit. And the dancing is legit. The people in that are legit. Um, White Knights. Yep. White Knights, Gregory Hines and Mikhail Baryshnikov. Yep. One of my favorite scenes ever in anything dance related when uh, Gregory Hines and Baryshnikov bet that Baryshnikov can't do 11 pirouettes with cowboy boots in a gymnasium, and it's a pretty epic scene. It's probably on YouTube. Like 11 ruples, 11 pirouettes. Yeah, so and that's Greg a good one. And Gregory Hyatt, and, and he bets his watch against 11 ruples, and uh, Baryshnikov stands back and looks at him in his Russian accent, and he goes, can you count? And then proceeds to do like 11 pirouettes and come out perfectly and collected. Like That's not Baryshnikov 11. does. What's that? Like he does. Yeah. Like he does. My record's eight, and that was a long time ago. That was like three terrible ones. Wait, I have answers. Oh, Emily's got answers. Yeah. More dance movies. Way more than that. Yeah. Yeah. More dance movies. <laughs> Take the Lead is a good one. That's Take with the Anthony, uh, Antonio Banderas. Cool. Um, Shall We Dance is a good one. Mm -hmm. Richard Gere and J Lo. That has a very iconic uh, tango scene. And I, you know what I like about Shall We Dance is when Richard Gere is sitting in like the, the lobby of the dance studio and he's watching everyone put on their weird dance shoes and he's like feels really stupidly self-conscious. Um, all you guys who remember your first time in a dance studio remember exactly what that feels like. Mm -hmm. For me, it didn't happen in a dance studio since I started a bar, but for me it was at jujitsu when I didn't know how to put on my belt and my gi. and a that great soundtrack too. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. What else you got dance movie wise? Scent of a Woman. Scent of a Woman has Scent an Woman? iconic dance scene in it. Oh. Um, same with True Lies, that has a very iconic oh, dance True scene. Lies. Uh, so I if am you the want Governator. some Schwarzenegger in your life, you can add that to the mix. I don't know if it's a dance movie, but. Live In? I've never heard of that. I've never heard of that, Kim, but we'll there's have to check the, that out. There's all the Step Up movies. Yeah, the first one's probably the best yeah. one. And then uh, there was Strictly, Strictly Dancing. Strictly Ballroom, the Boz Lorman one that yeah. was after Ray Iconic. Rivers. Iconic. Ray Rivers, one of my coaches, was a, like one of the um, characters. The yeah, characters. The main character, really. One of the main, yeah, the main character. Isn't that kind of cool? Ray Rivers, look up Ray Rivers. Living legend for ballroom dancing. One of the most fundamental people in my dance. Footloose has dancing in it. Yeah. The first one, not the new yep. one. Benjamin wants the mic, I can see him. There's a really cool series on YouTube called Step Up High Water. 
Um, and it's uh, it follows a couple of kids through a uh, like a Juilliard program. Oh, that's fun. Yeah. Cool. So it's a lot cool. of fun going through that. I like this. Dance movies. Yep. All right. Last question that we have. It's more of a request for the update on cruises. Oh, who the heck knows? Update on cruises. Um, very specifically for dance fun cruises, um, if you are booked on our Alaska or our uh, cruise to the Caribbean in October, they have not told us that it's not going. Are they really going? I don't know. I don't know. Um, we monitor that like literally daily. We have an inbox that's disgustingly full of updates from every major cruise line and every travel agency and all that stuff. Um, I just don't know. But as far as, and for those of you guys who don't know, the good news uh, these days, if you're booked on a cruise, typically there's all these cancellation policies and you're going to get stuck and you're not going to get any money back. But all of the cruise lines, as far as I know, and we are a registered travel agent with CLIA, um, they are giving, if they were to cancel the cruise, we get all of our money back, um, the, the rate for the cruise. So if you're booked with us, that's a little different because um, we're running a business, we have a little bit of upcharge to it, but they are giving all the money back if they cancel the cruise. Now, if you jump out and don't cancel and you were to cancel a cruise at this point, typically you'd lose your money. Um, but the cruise lines now are doing a cruise with confidence policy where they will give you a refund if you're to cancel and say, freak out, I don't want to go. Even next January, I don't want to go. They will, um, as far as I know, refund or give you your, a credit for your cruise. Um, and if the cruise lines were to cancel the cruise, like if you happen to be booked on our cruise to Alaska in mid-July, um, there's two options. You'll either get a refund or they'll give you like 125% in a cruise credit. Um, unfortunately, we're not able to process the cruise credit. Whole different story. But if you're booked on one of our cruises specifically, um, you've probably talked to Joanne and you can talk to Joanne again. She's a little bit more up on it than I am. But that is the groove with the cruises. Kind of weird. We're in all these people touching businesses, dance cruises, dance events, dancing. Um, so if you guys are around for the Q&A tomorrow night, we have a uh, special guest. I think it's pretty confirmed that it will be Marin Oslak, a good friend of mine, um, a former high level West Coast swing dancer. Um, she has a ballroom dance background, a country dance background. She has a dance studio. She has run several different West Coast swing events. Um, so she is my sister from another mister, uh, looks at dancing the, the same way I do and has a lot of knowledge. And a lot of you guys might not know her because her time on the scene, so to speak, was back, uh, you know, back in the day. But she's a very accomplished dancer, a great mind. Um, I love the way she interacts with her students. So she's going to be with us hopefully tomorrow night via Skype. And then I'm super excited because our Q&A next week, um, May 2nd, is going to be Forrest Outman, who is a friend of mine, uh, lives in the Tampa, Florida area. He's a dance historian, professional dancer, but he's a dance historian. He's a total nerd for dancing. So he said he agreed to that spot. We're going to have a chat. And he's, He's very methodical. He's like, Brian, I need to know the topics so I can come with my documentation. And so the topics I gave him, I said, look, people are going to ask you a crap load of questions about West Coast Swing. So be prepared for that. Um, but the neat thing about Forrest is he has a background in dance history in general. So even if we don't have specific answers for every iteration of West Coast Swing, what I enjoy about Forrest is he can give you the history of dance styles and how they move through culture and how they change and how they're influenced by music and the younger culture. And we can learn from his knowledge and other dance styles to predict where West Coast Swing is now and where it might go. I also, um, we're about to put out, I say about to, we're working on a video on the history of two-step. What is country two-step? What is West Coast Swing? Um, and so he is one of my go-to resources. So we will probably dig in a little bit to the history of two-step because despite the fact that I'm in the Country Dance Hall of Fame, I don't know, because I started dancing in 1997. I don't know where this came from, how it got to be. Um, so we're going to hopefully cover a little bit of two-step with Forrest. But um, yeah, so make sure you check that out. That's going to be really, really cool. And if you have any questions for him in a dance history perspective, should West Coast Swing change its name and all that jazz, um, bring those questions, shoot him an email, put them in the description, and we'll try to cover them on Saturday night. So we'll see you guys in about 23 hours. <laughs>